Hello and welcome to News Trash, the news programme on the Gig Show, where we do more than just read articles that other websites have written. My name is Rob, and as ever, I am joined by the man who reads articles, but tries to present them in a way where he's not just reading articles. Rob, as well. Hello there. Yes, um, I paraphrase and plagiarise with the best of them. Yes, so... Yeah, yeah that's a thinly veiled insult reduction. Hang on, is that the right <laughs> portmanteau? Insult reduction, yeah. Insult reduction. No, no, it's just an insult. <laughs> <laughs> and it was also an introduction of the many, many YouTubers out there who pass off reading other people's work as their own and create content out of it. Yeah, and, okay, yes, we are um, accessing various sites for news, but... I'd like to think that we're giving our own spin on things based on the information provided, rather than simply reading out the news verbatim. So let's let's kick off with uh, the obvious. Right, the elephant in the room is that there have been several uh, digital showcases. Let's call them that because I don't know what else to call them. Uh, there have been several that have happened, and Squeenix, Square Enix have decided to jump on that bandwagon with their own digital showcase in which they announced several things, some of which were predictable, some of which were... mm, Yeah. Before before we go into the who's and the how's and the he-has, I don't know why I worded it like that. Because you're Eeyore. (laughs) I watched this. uh, It was like 45 minutes of coming soon, coming soon, the stream starts soon, and the video is only like an hour and 15 minutes long, so it's like we're talking most of the actual experience was a streaming thing, but as I was watching it, after the fact, because I missed it live, the thought struck me. I thought, what's happened to Square Enix, man? They used to be such a, a mover and a shaker and a player. Because the reason I bring this up is, largely, a lot of the stuff that was covered at this uh, digital event, let's just call it, was there was lots of Avengers. There's like a new thing coming for um, Hawkeye. Yeah, there's the... Which fu- looks good, because it's got future- Maestro. But the game is awful, so, you know. Well, there's the Future Imperfect DLC, and for non-Marvel fans, let me explain quickly what the Future Imperfect is. It's where all the other heroes are dead, except for the Hulk, who has basically become old and uh, and power-crazed. And with the Future Imperfect D- DLC, Hulk has changed his name to Maestro because he is apparently smarter than everybody else and has managed to kill all the other heroes one way or another. They're all dead, right? And Hawkeye ends up in this imperfect future. Now, Future Imperfect was kind of a two-part crossover that came out during the 90s, and, uh, yeah, it had a lasting effect on Hulk because he, there was the suggestion that Hulk was, uh, well, certain untoward things happened to him involving a female slave, uh, where he was chained down and she took advantage of him. I'm pretty certain that the game does not reference any of that, right? No. But uh, beyond that, there was a little bit for Balan Wonderland, uh, Wonderworld, Wonderland, whatever it's called, which, which looks terrible. I will say it reminds me of two games specifically. It reminds me of Sonic the Hedgehog and Nights into Dreams. Well, that's kind of convenient because the guy who created both of them also created that. So. Yeah, exactly. You should hope so, shouldn't you? Well, the thing is, the <laughs> you know the main the main bad guy remind me, uh, or whatever it is with the top hat they reminded me of uh, Nights into Dreams, the character design and everything like that, and the motifs uh, the motif around the game. But the way that your characters run just reminded me of Sonic. The way they move and run remind me of Sonic. Okay. Um, what other things were there before we get to like the major? A uh, a thing for Outriders, which I was, you know, surprised It kind by. of went on too long. Yeah, <laughs> it, it dragged. Uh, there was the Black Panther thing for Marvel Avengers. Which, Black Panther looks good, but and I'd like to play it, but the game is garbage. Yeah, one thing that did make me, uh, did excite me, and I think there's a lot of potential in this game. I think that, and I'm surprised that it didn't happen ages ago, right? I'm surprised it didn't mm-hmm. happen ages ago. Just Cause Mobile, right? That has a lot of potential. If they manage to capture the insanity of a Just Cause game on a mobile device, it could be it could be a big game for them. It could be. I'm saying could. There are yeah. lots of ifs and coulds in this uh, in, in this uh, statement, and that's that's the thing. They you know 
getting, I, I mean, in Just Cause is one of those games where you either love it or you don't, okay? I really like the Just Cause games for the mechanics in the games. I like the whole uh, aspect of being a uh, paragl- uh, you know, parasail off the back of a moving vehicle and, you know, fly up a mountain with a parachute rather than down it. Um, you know, just the insanity of the physics in it. I love that. That's fine. That's fine. And, and there was a lot of collaborations with Taito, which made me think, have they have, have Square Enix bought Taito? No announcement of that yet, and I'd be a bit surprised if they had. But it's a number of things. It's not like a small collaboration. There was loads it, of stuff. Um, I mean, I, I, I actually don't know. Um, I don't know who bought Taito. I thought Taito. I thought Taito had, you know, still were uh, their own company. Yeah, but they're not exactly uh, prolific. Oh no, no, like, no, no. no. They were. Uh, they were bought by Square Enix. They were bought by Square Enix. That is. That is correct. Uh, they were bought in 2006. There was oh, a thing well, about a long time they've been acquired. Yeah, there, there were there was a thing about it. I remember from uh, from the early noughties. It was around 2000, 2005, 2006, something like that, when Square Enix bought Tato, and there was a big thing about it um, because it was uh, it was a, such a strange move at the time for Square. Yeah, so, and the last yeah. one was um, Project Athia. The PlayStation Five <laughs> exclusive, which looked like looked like nothing really. It looked like there was monsters and there was an engine, and it looked, you know, fair enough. And well, it's been given a name. It is for Forsy- for spoken. Yeah, and according to according to various dictionaries, including the Yorkshire Dictionary, for spoken, <laughs> yeah, for spoken, most important dictionary. Yeah. For spoken means to attract and fascinate, to enchant. To bewitch and to cast a spell over, so you know that song. Which kind of makes sense because there's, there's like somebody from the normal world, the, the reality that we know. This is what you can sort of uh, divulge from the trailer and the information so far. Somebody from our world is thrown into a world of monsters and dragons and oh my god, otherworldly things, and that's original, isn't it? Oh yeah. Oh, uh, the, the, cue the uh, awful reaction. <laughs> Oh my god, they've done an Isekai game! Wah! <laughs> yeah. I mean, the way. That you, I really don't care about this. The, it looks great. Like, graphically, it looks very good. The way the character moves around looks very invigorating because it's, that's one of the great successes of Spider Man. It's fun to move around the world. Yeah, I mean, but beyond the that, is, there's nothing the, there which really. The movement anything. of the character. The movement of the character just reminds. Uh, did you ever play Warframe? No. Okay, the movement of the character reminds me of Warframe. It's very similar to the character, to character movements in Warframe. Um, the thing that I, the thing that I couldn't get past once I found out what Forspoken meant in my head, automatically I went, you know that song, I put a spell on you, and yeah. that that changed to I've Forspoken you, and it's just not good as that version. It kind <laughs> of then, scans to the same <laughs> tune now. Yeah, I've Forspoken you, cause you're mine, and. Th- and then I thought, hang on, how does this relate to dragons? I don't know. It's too early to really have an opinion on this, besides the fact that, yeah, it's too early. Well, yeah, yeah, that's, the, that's, that's not we'll say the same thing twice in the bounds. Yeah. It's really, really early, and all you can really judge it on is its graphics. And the graphics, yeah, they're good. Yeah. The world I- design seems cute in a sort of monster's sense, but beyond that, there's nothing to really say. Yeah. Um, the one of the other things that uh, Squeenix announced was the Survivor Trilogy for Tomb Raider, which... It's just a collection, a re-release yeah. collection. Which, uh, I'm not sure about that because, um... I mean, I've already got two. I could just buy I... the third one for, like, the third one is in the first one for about three quid and I'd be done. Yeah, I, I you know? own all of the games already. I'm just, that's why I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure about it. I mean, the big thing, though. That Square Enix announced, and uh, I was not surprised because I get the feeling that Square Enix have kind of they've kind of put a lot of eggs in the Life is Strange basket. Yeah, I mean, it, it, that, you were talking earlier about uh, I can't remember what it was, but you either care or you don't. Yeah, to Life is Strange is the capital letter of that idea because it's fans that absolutely adore it. Yeah. I, on the other hand, many people like me genuinely don't care one way or the other. Yeah, I'm. 
the original Life is Strange was okay. It was an interesting game, but I felt that uh, I felt that the story was well. I felt it was juvenile in certain ways. There were elements of it that just didn't feel uh, like a, a real person. I thought the game was going to be a, an examination of loss and grief and stuff like that, but it's not. It's a murder mystery type thing or an accident mystery thriller type thing. I thought, okay, um, these games, Life is Strange as a concept to me, really works for one specific reason. You could use it as... Uh, right, do you remember I, I uh, reviewed a game ages ago called Neocab, which was trying to use emotions as a method of storytelling, right? And I would love to see that built on. I'd love to see that concept built on where they actually explore the emotional side uh, and actually have it as part of the game itself so that you can exp- you can make an exploration of le- love or pride or grief or you know various things like that and actually that I fa- I think would be helpful to people and life is strange is one of those prominent games where they could really start looking at these things and I feel like they kind of sell it short when they start introducing aspects to it that you know that don't actually fit the process does that make sense but anyway, um, I'd like to, I'd like it if this Life is Strange True Colors uh, was uh, was more of an examination of grief and coming to terms with loss, um, especially given the last year and a bit that we've had, uh, yeah. rather than just the usual. Oh look, something's happened to one of the characters. Uh, you know, a character that was close to the main character. And so the main character has to investigate and find out what happened to that character, which we've seen ad infinitum in video games and in movies and in books and in comics. I mean, sidestepping my opinion for a little bit, the one thing I always thought about um, Life is Strange is it looks awfully identikit. Like, just remove these characters and put in some new ones, and there you go, sequel. And the one thing that's different about this is they've actually changed the art style, so they've improved the art style, so that's something. But still, it feels like... Pick out these characters, drop in some more, bomb bang being sequel. Do you know my first thought when I saw it? My first thought when I saw the main character is, my sister's got those glasses. That was literally my first thought. When I saw the main character, I was like, my sister's got those glasses. Leaving the Squeenix uh, digital showcase to one side and moving on to more PlayStation, PlayStation VR 2 news, they finally released pictures of the controller and... It looks awesome. Unusual. It looks awesome, but unusual. Um, it kind yeah, of I mean, reminds I'm, me. I'm not being one of these internet. T- just before you, I'm just using the word awesome correctly. Yeah. Because people use awesome to mean anything that they approve of or think is good. I'm using awesome in this context because it inspires awe. Because when you think of something like VR, you think of future gaming, the world of the future, weirdo, woo woo yeah. woo, all this nonsense stuff like, you know, uh, what's. Blue sky thinking, I think is yeah. the, te- the business term for it. Whereas the PlayStation VR was two two old generations uh, move controllers and uh, like a, just very old tech. Yeah. Whereas these controllers, they are these weird circular devices which have carved up half the controls of one, well, half the controllers of a dual sense and put half on each thing. It's very very futuristic and it inspires awe because f- games have to evolve. You can't just constantly have this one controller in front of you. The format for which we interact with games has to evolve, and this is very much that, and it inspired art with what could be possible with future developments. That's all I'll say. I'll let you finish now. No, uh, I actually actually agree with you. I think that the design of the controller is really unique and actually quite inspired. I think the design of the controller Mm. is actually quite inspired. One One of the things that I really... Uh, that I really would like to see with this controller is, you know, because you put your hand through the ring and it basically, it's as if there's a sphere around your hand. You can imagine that there's a ball around your hand. You see what I mean? And you're you're basically gripping the thing inside the ball. And that, I think, if they basically made, you know, the ring that goes around your wrist and up the back, if they put like gyroscopes in there uh, or had some kind of gyroscopic function in there so that when you turn your hands and stuff like that, I mean, you have seen some of the uh, you have seen some of the patents that they're being working with, haven't you? Yeah, and I have the technology of 
So I, this is very much a possibility that they've yeah. done that. And the thing is, I'd love it if they basically, because they've got the handle thing, they've got the grip handle thing. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I would love for them to do, because um, one of the things that so many people like me, right, I love spaceships. I love giant robots. I love mechs. I love anything <laughs> like that, right? You know this, okay? Terminal- well, before you go there, I want to play games that I don't feel like I've played 100 times before. I yeah. feel like I have a point to sort of coalescing here. Yeah. And if you're talking about gyroscopes and VR, I think we're talking about the same thing here. What? It's are completely you... changing the way you interact with a game, isn't it? And completely yeah. changing the types of games yeah. you can make. And See, it's not just fly the spaceship with one stick and yep. point the gun with See, another. It's completely evolution, yeah. re- revolutionizing certain types of games. See, right. Um, when you basically have... When you watch any kind of uh, mech-based anime or something like that, or even when you uh, look at games like StarCraft and that, and you look at the powered suits that have in StarCraft or maybe in Warhammer or something like that, when you have the pilot getting into the suit, what they'll have, they'll have a handle, but the handle will have buttons on it for each of the fingers and the thumb, right? So that the fingers on the actual suit can move by pressing the buttons. And imagine if you had that that grip had different different buttons for each of the fingers on that to replace different buttons, and you could basically move things in in real time using the gyroscopic function of the thing, then you could make a game where you are, you know, controlling, say, um, uh, a VF uh, transforming fighter from Macross or the maybe a Gundam best, or something like that. Best ever Godzilla game. Oh, should I reword that? Oh, yeah, the no, no. ever good Godzilla game. Oh, God, yeah. You could you could be the, ki- be the kaiju. That would, I, I mean, do uh, you remember Evolve where you were supposed to be the monster? Imagine if yeah, you had was- total... Imagine if you had total control over that. So literally, you could be whatever monster, and you could have the functionality where you could where you could basically climb the ceilings quite easily. You could grab things, and you could literally just no, grab mean, like let's that. Just, let's just go back to the Godzilla thing. You uh, a ge- you have a game where you basically play as Godzilla, and the challenge is you go through every one of the movies. So the first part of the game is the original movie. And then you keep on, and as it evolves, you start fighting these other massive kaiju's. Hang on, so it's hang not on, like you just walking through. It's not just like you're walking through a cityscape destroying stuff. That's the first level. The first movie is like a tutorial where you just destroy stuff, and then you get. I think it was a hydrogen bomb that they end up destroying it with, or destroying in quotation no, marks. No, no, it was and the, then the opposite, sequel. It was you the, fight another monsters. So I should pitch games. This is a great game idea. It's the, you were talking <laughs> about the oxygen, the oxygen destroyer, which is how they got rid of That's Godzilla. That's the one. The first yeah. One. Um, I've been waving my finger at Rob for a while now because I wanted to stop him, but he carried on even though I was waving finger. Um, I had momentum, Rob. I know you did, but what you're talking about when you say <laughs> Godzilla fighting uh, fighting different kaiju from different uh, from different movies and moving his way through the movies, you're talking about Godzilla Final Wars. Yeah, well, that's the movie. Yeah, I know. You're talking that's about not the a mo- game, though, is it? You're talking about a video game version of that, and I don't. I totally agree. I I I, I actually really want this game. <laughs> can I just say, um, if that is what the future of VR can have, I'm all in. I, uh, you know, if there was a game where I, as Godzilla, could people's elbow another kaiju, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sold. I'm yeah. I, that that that's it. That's my game. <laughs> and I think honestly, the way those controllers have been designed, ergonomically speaking, yeah. opens up a lot of possibilities for VR games on the console space, which yeah. just wasn't there beforehand. Because using an old Move controller, which is very very crude. It's not very flexible. It's not designed for that purpose. Whereas this is a VR handset, essentially, which is absolutely designed around making the most out of the VR experience. And when things are designed like that, the possibilities are much more wide and open. And it goes back to my reservations with VR at this point. They've always been very short passing experiences. I think only Half-Life Alex was kind of... There's others, but... I feel like Alex is like the whole only major high profile exception to that rule. Mm. Right. Now, um, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about uh, a small story that probably hasn't had a lot of attention uh, from just about anyone else. But uh, I wanted to bring some attention to it because um, Sony have got their cloud gaming service, right? PlayStation Now. Yeah. 
Well, there are various other cloud services available. And one of them, it's a cloud game technology company called uh, Ubitus, right? And they offer a variety of solutions to help to help their customers build cloud game uh, businesses. Yeah. Now, Sony have Sony. Um, what was it? Uh, Sony In- Innovation Fund uh, by IGV and Square Enix, Actors, and Tencent have done a round of combined funding for Ubitus, uh, which runs into the tens of millions. Yeah. So for things like Square Enix, Tencent, and Sony to, to pay attention to a company like Ubitus and actually throw money at them, and they're a cloud gaming service. It's yeah. There's uh, ways to read this. The, it's an um, interesting. It's an interesting one because a lot of people. This is one of those news stories where a lot of people look at it and say, "Okay, yeah, it's a cloud gaming service." Don't really pay attention to it, but then several years, you know, a couple of years down the line. All of a sudden, something happens which leads back to this original story. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I mean, looking at like the, the the timeline of the Xbox One. Yeah, what they're pitched in their opening um, press conference was basically what they have become. Mm. It's just they were a few years ahead of what the industry was ready for. Yeah, and this so is one of those. Like time makes forward-thinking stories, you know. Yeah, hold some more weight than you actually might think they do. Yeah, and it has been reported that uh, investors have put in about forty-five million, uh, and valued uh, you know at a valuation of less than four hundred million, which is according to Bloomberg. But uh, the CEO of Ubit- Ubitus, which is uh, a guy called Wesley Kuo, has said uh, we are very excited to have some of the most important players in the game industry as our strategic shareholders. Their investments represent a vote of confidence in our technology our achievements, and our potential role in the rapidly rapidly growing cloud game market. With our innovative technology and their resources, we shall help more partners roll out cloud game content and services and accelerate the industry's transformation to the cloud. There's further ways to read this. Yeah, do you see what I mean? Yeah, I mean, there's one that the industry is threatened by Microsoft and the Games Pass. But I think, honestly... Games Pass is good, but it's not going to change the industry on its own. It needs competition. Yeah. Um, and I think this represents that competition. This potentially represent that com- represents that competition. And as we've, as we've said on many occasions, competition is the best way forward for the games industry. It needs that competition to be healthy. It needs that competition to um, be imaginative. It needs that competition to breed success. Yeah. A monopoly doesn't breed success. It just breeds it's stagnation. Just one person, anyway. No, it just breeds stagnation. That's all a monopoly does. It breeds stagnation. You become sta- static. People don't yeah, think. That, that, they don't that's innovate. True. Because if you're successful, regardless of what you do, why bother trying? Exactly. Uh, that, that's the thing. Uh, pity the man who always succeeds, because he'll never learn anything. Uh, or yeah. the Mythbusters version, which I kind of prefer, because the other one's quite wordy, which is failure is always an option. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting, cloud gaming. I mean, honestly, I don't think... Get a little bit political here. Mm. I like to try to remain apolitical, but there was one political party, I'm not going to say who, because I want to remain absolutely neutral, even though me, in my personal life, I'm not neutral. Bit of a socialist, but yeah. Uh, there was a certain politician who said that internet access should be available to everybody. It shouldn't be paid for, it should just be accessed across the across the country. And COVID made that a all too glaring obvious truth. Yeah. The reason why you bring that up is I don't think cloud gaming can really flourish and fly without having internet widely available at that sort of level. Yeah. Because for us in the UK, I'd say our internet is is okay. It's yeah, it's, it's not solid. The best. It's not the best. It's better, it's better than Australia. Australia have had real problems with it. Um, Outside in North America, I think like San Francisco, LA, New York are pretty solid, but beyond that, we're kind of very, very inconsistent. So it's not like everybody uniformly has amazing high speed, reliable internet broadband speeds. So cloud gaming, I think, is still a little bit too pie in the sky. I think you got to get your fundamentals before you get the the uh, dreaming big ideas. Well, um, yeah, I I get what you're saying. Um, the thing that 
makes me think that cloud gaming is probably might be closer than people believe. And, and, and by closer, I don't mean like six months off. Oh, I mean no, it's no, no, it's no. still it's still a couple of years, but I would say within within two years, I would say I think it's that close. I'd say within two years, you'll see a big change in cloud gaming. And the reason I say that isn't because of consoles or PCs. It's because of mobile phones. It's it's literally because a lot of mobile phones now are more focused on gaming services and stuff like that and becoming platforms for gaming, you know, becoming uh, able to play more high-end games on mobile devices. A lot of mobile phone companies are developing their phones with that uh, as a key um as a key factor for selling their phone. Well, it's the and, Razor phone, isn't it? Which is a well, mobile phone. Uh, thing is, I'm not just uh, talking about and all phones have and all phones have game all modern phones anyway, mine does and I know yours yeah. does, have a gaming mode where they just turn everything off and optimize it for games playing. Exactly, and that's my point. Um when you've got phones that where that is a key feature, that is a key selling feature of the phone. Uh, and most phones these days, most flagship phones these days do that. In fact, I think all flagship phones do that now, don't they? So that's the reason why I think it's closer than we than we might believe, um, because of mobile technology, um, because mobile phones are advancing at a pace that is ridiculous. Well, re- related back to the European story, um, competition having this endeavour alongside Games Pass hmm. speeds up that process. Yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, uh, you did mention COVID, uh, and so we obviously have a story about that's related to the pandemic. Uh, this one is more, well, the Association for UK Interactive Entertainment, or the UKIE. Yeah. Uh, I call them UKI, which I quite like. Um, <laughs> anyway, they've compiled a an annual market valuation, and they've discovered that the pandemic Oh, the pandemic. The pandemic has driven UK games market sales to a record seven billion a year. Yeah, there was a new story in the Guardian which looked at this like it's an absolute waste of time, and COVID boredom drove people to pick up gaming. Like it was a last resort. Oh no! No, I mean uh, let, let's put it this way, right? Uh, video game products and culture rose by thirty percent. Topping the 2018 record by more than one billion. That's not a small spike. That's not a. That's not a, a blip. Let's let's be perfectly frank here. This is a big spike. Yeah. But also at the same time, every year video games has been grown as an industry. It's bigger than movies and music combined. Yeah. So this is not a small industry which has suddenly became huge. This is a huge industry that's which become, became huge. Yeah. And. A thirty percent in a thirty percent increase is not a small increase. I mean, whether it's main, whether it's maintainable remains to be seen. Yeah, but it's a significant it, boost. It is a significant boost, and I just wanted to bring attention to that because it's one of those things where uh, where a lot of people don't seem to realise just how big the video games industry is. They still continue to believe that the video games industry is a niche industry. When it's really, really mainstream. Yeah. It's the biggest industry, like I said. It's the biggest entertainment industry. Exactly. Um, something that isn't quite mainstream, especially if, uh, well, especially if you're the Chinese government, is uh, Red Candle Games. Yeah. I mean, they've done um, Detention, which we both are big fans of. and Devotion. Um, the other game, which wasn't quite so... Beloved. It wasn't quite well. It wasn't quite so beloved by the Chinese government because of that meme where they compared Xi Jinping to Winnie the Pooh, and apparently, and there's a reference to it in the game. Yeah, that's yeah. why they. Uh, that's why they weren't allowed to sell the game. I mean, uh, I really wished CD Projekt Red had stuck to the guns and sold Devotion on GOG uh, in December, but obviously pressure was put on them from other sides. Uh, I'm not going to mention who. Um, I I'm not going to get into the whole thing with uh, you know uh, with mockery of particular individuals, you know, because at the end of the day, I don't really care. What I do care about though, it's not about caring or not caring. It's international politics, and it's very dicey. Yeah, I know. Um, when I say I don't really care, I, I basically mean I don't want to get. I, I don't want to disappear 
and uh, end up in yeah, like end, I say, end up in a camp politics. yeah end up in a camp where they're re-educating me. Well, to be honest, Rob, I think you could do with it. <laughs> <laughs> I do not. Uh, <laughs> Maybe not that way. Maybe not. No, that no, way. no. Because uh, part of my re-education, they'd put me in the remedial class. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, anyway, we kind of swear that. Yeah. <laughs> I think rather tastefully, but yeah, go on. Devotion is back on sale on Red Candle Games' own eShop because they basically had no luck selling it anywhere else. Um, and it's come at the same time as them tweeting out um, a small video of a new game that they're working on, which uh, you know they haven't really, um, they haven't really. Yet there's not real information about it. They've just said, look, hey, we're working on something new, which I'm surprised by. Uh, but yeah, uh, the fact that you can get Devotion now... Honestly, I'm surprised they still are a company because I was very, very worried that having a game basically made into a seditious piece of contraband yeah. would be the end of any Chinese company. I mean, they're not Chinese technically. They're in Taiwan, I believe, uh, Red Candle Games. But yeah, this is a thing which has killed many companies before them and yeah. probably after them too. So the fact that they still had enough fluidity, not only, I wouldn't say eat the loss of this game, because this will have damaged them quite badly. Mm. But the fact that they were sort of able to dust themselves off and look forward to the future and start a new game, that makes me quite happy that there's so much doom and gloom in video games. This is, this is nice. Yeah. This is a nice story. I know. Uh, Ra- wrapped in absolute horribleness, but still. The fa- the fact that Devotion is now on sale, and Devotion to the people who've played it is. Every- everyone who's played it regards it as one of the finest horror games to come out in the last decade. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, quite literally, I, That's good. I have yet to see. Uh, I, obviously, every game has its detractors, but Devotion is almost universally praised as one of the finest horror games to come out in the last decade. Um, it, it's it's crafted that well. And so I think it's one of those games that if you don't know it and if you're uh, you, and you're a fan of horror, then you really need to look it up because Detention was an amazing game. Yeah, it was quite... It, it alienated a lot of people because it looks like an indie game. And when yeah. an indie game looks like an indie game, you have a certain audience that go, I'm not playing that crappy 8-bit one indie game. Yeah. It wasn't 8-bit, but it's the sentiment that a lot of people have. Yeah. But yeah, this is a proper um, modern graphics, first-person perspective horror game. Yeah. Yes, it is. So, um, anyway, uh, I'm not going to talk about what other games have been delayed. If you want to know, it's Gotham Knights, but that's, you know, uh, that's neither here nor there. There was no date attached to that anyway. I'm assuming it's being pushed to next year yeah. then. 2022 is the only thing that's been told about it. Um, but I really, again, it's one of those one of those things where I really don't care anymore. There's been that many games that have been delayed now, and we called it. Yeah, refer to our two episodes where we predicted there was going to be a game drought and that we're in the middle of a game drought. Yeah. 2021 is feeling the effect. All right, let's put it this way. The video game industry had a major bender on 2020 this is like the bender and our benders it went from pub to pub to pub to pub to pub to pub to pub and now it's got a blinding headache and a horrible hangover so it's just not doing anything for a while it's just gonna lay and sleep hang on hang on hang on and then it'll wake up in 2022 when it's ready to do some stuff again to paraphrase uh, a, a comedian that i really like are you saying that the video games industry has been on something like a 10-year bender and is now metaphorically hugging the toilet bowl? <laughs> yeah. It's doing that. So, anyway... It's uh, hugging the toilet bowl, and it's got somebody else, it's got, like, the movie industry holding its hair, so it doesn't yeah. come out on its hair in the toilet. Say, so it'll all be okay. It'll all There's be okay. There's an image for you. Anyway, <laughs> going from one bizarre image to another bizarre image... Um, Obviously, we all know Super Nintendo World has had its opening ceremony. The Super Nintendo World at Universal Studios Japan uh, has finally had its opening ceremony. And a bizarre and strange place it is indeed, uh, being kind of the video game equivalent of uh, Disneyland, I suppose. It's, 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 a, it's a strange thing to see. You know, light. Uh, you know, full size Mario and Luigi greeting customers and walking down tunnels with Shigeru Miyamoto 
And, you know, just... What, is there somebody, like, dressed up as Shigeru Miyamoto, <laughs> like, in one of those mask outfits? Because that is worth the praise of admission. No, it's it's actually him, <laughs> well, you know, uh, walking down tunnels Aww. and standing next to Princess Peach. Um, and just, just general strange imagery of uh, mascot characters. You know how much Japan loves their mascot characters anyway. And Have they got a, re- a mascot character of Reggie? Well, no, they don't, but you, you've you got Todd <laughs> and Princess Peach. A certain fandom would love that, wouldn't they? You've got Tro- Todd and Princess Peach. I have yet to see a Bowser in any of the pictures, but uh, it seems like it's a big hit, you know. Um, but on the back of that... Of course, of course. On the back of that... Right on the back of that, Sony, um, Sony bought a stake in Evo. You know the fighting tournament, sorta. Of, but e esports aren't really my thing, like at all. Yeah, but that's the thing. Uh, Sony, Sony haven't really ventured into esports pretty much at all. But now all of a sudden, with kind of no prior warning, they've bought a stake in the Evolution Championship Series Evo, as it's also known. And they will be running it alongside the esports company, uh, a new esports company called RTS, um, which for me always stands for real time strategy. Anyway, um, yeah. Evo is a popular esports tournament. And I don't know, does this signal that Sony is going to be moving into more event based things? Is it going to be pushing? Not necessarily. Do, do you see what I mean? Uh, I'm, I'm a bit surprised by this move. To use the business ease. For this, mm. they are diversifying their portfolio. Yeah, but when you're diversifying your portfolio, there's always an end goal, and I'm curious what the end goal of this particular move is because I don't think they're going to take on the likes of League of, League of Legends or anything like that. I don't think they're that- no. Um, I think it's just sort of a uh, Sony have often been accused of being quite backwards looking yeah and um, look at the xbox it's about the future it's about cloud streaming it's about streaming services about subscription services very very forward thinking yeah whereas sony are all about you have to buy the game you have to upgrade the software all this old sort of philosophy and they've been accused of being very much old, an old headed company yeah whereas one of the big emerging trends in video game industry is esports yeah it's the it's grown probably more than anybody expected it would yeah and I see this as an in, uh, Sony sort of modernising or open the doors to modernisation and not being so retro in their business philosophy. I mean, the thing that uh, the thing that I'm puzzled, I, I'm curious about is how Sony as a company are going to link Evo back into uh, PlayStation, for example, because that that would be the ideal thing for them to do. Okay, you have tournaments for Super Smash Brothers and Mario Kart. You have tournaments for FIFA. You have tournaments for StarCraft and League of Legends and various other things like that. How are Sony going to try and loop Evo back in to yeah. PlayStation? That's that's the challenge I think um, they've got. The head, I think the head of Worldwide Studios, I think it's called Herman Hulse, yeah. he used to di- uh, run um, Guerrilla Games. Mm. Also, speaking of Guerrilla Games, there is 10 free games coming to PlayStation Network, even if you haven't got PS Plus and Horizon is one of them. So please... Pick it up. It's definitely worth it for free. But anyway, Herman Hulst said he wants to diversify the ta- sort of first-party games that Sony are making. He wants to open the open the possibility of multiplayer games. He wants to try different things. So he wants to have an impact on the sort of titles that Sony Studios to give the first-party uh, wing their proper title now. He wants to diversify what they are and what they offer. So I can see these sort of interlinking with each other. Yeah, yeah. Also interlinking with each other, we have a Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash the gig show. Subtle hint, subtle plug there. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I am curious where the uh, where the Evo link is going to go. I will be keeping an eye on that. So uh, once we know what's happening with that, you know, are there any going to be any changes to Evo? Um... Because there may not be. It may be that Sony have simply bought it because they felt like it. I don't they do that. I don't think they do that either. L- there l- is l- a- l- imp- they'll implement something from their catalogue of games or upcoming catalogue of games yeah, w- to tie in with Evo. There will be there will be something that loops back into the PlayStation um, and to help boost PlayStation sales. What it is, I don't know yet. Even if it's just calling the event 
Sony Ev- Sony's Evo. Like, you know, there's it, Sony presents Evo. You know, that sort of thing. Wild idea. Wild idea, right? And this is a really wild idea. This is basically on the scale of the Xbox laptop that we were talking about, right? This is yeah. this is that wild an idea. But you know what we're talking about the PlayStation VR PlayStation VR two controller, yeah? Yes. Um, there used to be a thing. I, I think it was called Fightbox or something like that, where you, uh, which was available on the PlayStation two. I think it was. It was a two or three, and basically it was a controller for your hand and for your hands and your feet. And you basically could mimic kick and punch movements with it of okay. characters on the screen. So basically, if you punched, your character punched. If you kicked, your character kicked. And esports likes to push that their players are athletes. And my brain is now <laughs> linking all of this together in some weird virtual reality punch up where, you know, you've got your PlayStation VR controllers with something that links to your feet, and you basically do it. You, maybe it's Street Fighter 2, but you actually have to do the movement for Hadouken before you actually actually do Hadouken because you're playing it in virtual reality. I don't know. I'm punting here hard. Yeah. So we kind of uh, wrap up there, then. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we go. We should have done this a while ago. Um, this is the YouTube version of the show, or maybe it's the podcast version of the show, if it's the podcast version, uh, do give us a rating because we do need them to help us, us grow. But uh, elsewhere, things that we have going on, um, there was a new episode of our Patreon podcast director's lottery up over the weekend. So check that out. One pound tier, that is. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's Pop Screen, our movies and music podcast that Graham does, which I think you can also get elsewhere on the channel. I'll put a little link up in the top corner so you can get that. If you're listening to this on a podcast feed, there's a second half, which is Impossible Mission, so stay tuned for that. But if not, thank you very, very much for watching. We appreciate your company each and every week, and we will see you next time. Bye!